Mr. Walton, did you make contact with Alien? Were you taken to another planet, to a mothership? How do they communicate with them? Can you tell me what they look like? Can you tell me how many of them there were? Were you, were you given food? But the teachers are alive. They're not books. They are the very living essences of nature itself. What a strange person. Unbelievably powerful supercomputer that's running our reality, and we don't have a clue yep. as to how to operate it. So when maybe you or somebody else creates an AGI system, and you get to ask her one question, what would that question be? What's outside the simulation? Say in your mind, say to yourself, I am more than my physical body because I am more than physical matter. I can perceive that which is greater than the physical world. There is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Broadcasting from a shack on a hill in the Mossy Creek bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas. This is Lighting the Void, and I'm your host, Joe Root. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's Monday, June the 15th. Sean Cannon is our guest tonight. And uh, Sean, JohnCannon.com is the website. I hope you guys had a great weekend. Uh, if you are in the natural state or listening in the south, it is one hell of a night to watch the night sky. The fireflies are out. It's a beautiful night, actually. Um, I just went on a really awesome walk before the show to try to blow off some steam. Right? Um, I heard I heard uh, Cosmic Keys on before this, and I heard th- them talking about uh, the energies and stuff that are going on. And, you know, a big shout-out to Rivers in the chat room. I know a lot of people are going through some heavy transitional energies right now some of that stuff can be pretty tough and uh you just gotta hang in there and try to stay around as much positivity and happiness as you can and try to you know put up your blocks and the negative stuff yeah i mean that's kind of basic right that's like basic stuff but that's what we're all doing right now and thank you for listening tonight if you're just joining us we're live on the fringe fm call a number for tonight's 1-800-588-0335 when we open the phone lines up you can join the chat by going to the Fringe FM chat room at the fringe.fm forward slash chat room. Yeah, fringe.fm forward slash chat room. I want to give our sponsors a big shout out Metaphorical Archaeology, AncientLifeWorld.com, and GetTheT.com, and also our partners at UFOSeekers.com. We really love what they're doing. They're the best in the field and uh, can't wait. I think they're getting their due. I hope so. You guys really go to ufoseekers.com, check out their work, get their videos, subscribe to all their stuff, and you'll see what Real Investigations is all about. So tonight our guest is uh, Sean Cannon, and uh, Sean has been studying the multidimensional universe according to the ancient Vedic texts of India for the past 11 years, and his journey has given him a profound understanding of why the multiverse exists, that consciousness is actually not a physical manifestation, Uh, the nature of the absolute truth why souls reincarnate according to Vedic knowledge, 
and ultimately why the human form is the most highly desired form throughout the multiverse. He graduated with a BFA in fine art from the University of Arizona, and although art allows him to express his creative side, he is passionate about sharing the confidential aspects of Vedic philosophy. For literature, maps, art, photos, and basically everything you could ever want to fulfill your curiosity and get you started on your research of the ancient Vedic texts, please email Sean Cannon at SeanVedicVisuals at gmail.com. Also, the website, again, is SeanJohnCannon.com. Sean, thanks for coming on the program. It's good to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, I got to tell you that statement that you said about the human uh, form, I I was just talking to an, a guest about this last week. We, you know, we were talking about aliens and stuff, and he was uh, he was I think it was last week. It might have been the week before last. I get him confused. Anyways, he was saying we were talking about grays and stuff, and I said, you know, like the gray alien body isn't really doesn't look all that attractive to me. You hear all these people talking about like I want to leave this place. I can't stand the world. And it, well, you look out in the universe; it's a beautiful place. But as far as life is concerned. I don't think there's anything more beautiful than the human being. I just, there, there's nothing that shows that, right? I mean, where did you get that philosophy from? You know, it, it all began about, uh, yeah, oh, just over, um, what, 13 years ago. I, uh, I chose a diet um, that was more compassionate, and that's all I'll say. And one thing led to another, and I started uh, – uh, I inherited some spiritual friends. Um, it's called Govinda's um, here in Tucson, Arizona. And I noticed that um, when I was with these people, that there was an energy. There was an energy that was very familiar that my brain couldn't under- understand. And it all began when I was associating with these Vedic people. And they taught me in due course of time that my physical form is the product of desire and karma. And they zoomed all the way back, back to uh, the eternal consciousness that we all come from. And, and over the years, I've been given these incredible x-rays. I call them, I, I lovingly call them x-rays of reality. And by the way, they're unending. <laughs> You can't ever know them all and, and, you know, completely. We would need about maybe a thousand years to completely understand the Vedas. So in due course of time associating with these wonderful Vedic people, I, I, I gradually understood that my consciousness, the, 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 the me within the body, that consciousness is actually not the product of my brain, a biological AI machine that assumes it to be the be all and end all. And curiously, according to the Vedas, that's what the multiverse, that's what the universe is designed to, uh, it was designed for living entities to assume themselves as separate individuals. To like, if you go up to a, a parrot or a, a lion or a rattlesnake, they're pretty convinced that they are those forms. <laughs> you know, they all behave in a certain way. Um, they have uh, different intelligences and whatnot. And um, ego is within every living entity. Uh, ego is not a bad thing, by the way. Um, ego just means spirit, self. False ego means that that you're not. So what is the, what is the paradoxical situation here? The soul is the same within every single living entity. What is different is the form it occupies. And this was the beginning foundation of my journey. And these people, these Vedic people, were very inclined towards a a being that appeared here on Earth 5,000 years ago, Krishna. And Krishna essentially says that there's only one thing that you have to accept on blind faith. In other words, this realization can never be proven to you physically. It's a paradox. And that is that you are an eternal consciousness and not the ephemeral body. Your limited, um, imperfect senses are not the be-all and end-all of your existence. And that's the beginning point of self-realization. It's the only thing you have to accept. All knowledge predicates upon that. 
Yeah, that is really profound stuff you're talking about there, man. I think it's, I think it's a hundred percent true because I got to tell you, um, the whole reason why I started this broadcast radio station, everything like that was because I had an out of physical experience, you know, that changed my entire paradigm. It just, it's like, it made me think what, what else is out there? You know, like, what is this all about? And then I, you know, I got into studying, uh, Western esotericism, even Eastern stuff, uh, alchemy, sacred sexuality, stuff like that. These energies, all of this stuff, pranayama, you name it. And started realizing like, Hey man, we got all these subtle energies and subtle bodies. Like, do we really know what the hell we're doing? You know, like, <laughs> do we uh, seriously, do we know what we're doing? Because everything seems to be like in a mess most of the time here and it doesn't have to be. Uh, but I think, I think we got some, I think there's some sacred information we need to go inside and figure out, you know? You know, the debate has explained that um, there was never a time, particularly in the 5,000-year-old Bhagavad Gita, as it is, that version. It, the, the Bhagavad Gita explains that there was never a time you did not exist, and there will never, never, ever be a time that you'll cease to exist. Now, Einstein said, you know, energy can either be created or destroyed. And in the eternal consciousness that um, we, where we were born from, well, our, our constitutional position is eternal. We're omnipotent like God, and we're full of bliss just like God. We are endowed with the same qualities of God. We're just different in quantity. And so essentially, um, the Vedas would say, uh, you and I, after having dinner with God one night, after picking our teeth, <laughs> we essentially looked at God and we said, why is it always about you? Why is everything always about you? And after probably, what, 200 trillion Earth years of <laughs> behaving like this, you and I were so determined to find something other than God, to, to be our own nucleus, to be our own self-serving entities. And so begrudgingly, um, the Vedas explain that uh, Krishna, um, which means all attractive, um, assumed a form called Maha Vishnu, and Mahavishnu, in the cosmic form, created the multiverse. He dreams it. He actually dreams the multiverse into fruition. And from there, that was the beginning point of us entering this matrix. We wanted separation. We wanted to enjoy separately. Our constitutional nature is to enjoy with God unlimitedly. But the material energy is very limited. We can see evidence of that in our lives. Things begin, things end. So this is why ultimately we were born into this multiverse, to find something better than God. And ultimately, that's why we suffer. <laughs> you know, sometimes I wonder, uh, too, what, like, I used to think, like, deep down, that what if God was trying to figure out, you know, how you're, that question is like, why is it about you? Why is it about you and you're asking about God or whatever? So it's like, what if God was trying to figure out who it was? I mean, because if you think about it, it's like, if you're Alpha Omega, you're everything. You got nothing to compare to. Then how do you know who you are? The only thing you can do is break yourself down into incremental parts and just try to figure it out that way if there's really nothing else, you know? But that's actually a really interesting point you're making because the multiverse is a natural it's actually one fourth of God's total energy. What I mean, what I'm telling you is trillions and trillions of universes, not just galaxies, infinite number of universes is one fourth of God's total energy, according to the Srimad Bhagavatam of India. Three fourths of God's energy is unending love. So I would answer that to say, it's like saying, well, why did the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, Switzerland um, build itself? Did it build itself to understand why it's trying to split atom, uh, particles? No, mm. it, it, it already knows what its function is. And so we, it's our, it's because we are so convinced we are physical machines, we don't understand that actually spirit animates matter. So our dull senses will never see the spirit within us. Um, and by the way, if we could, that would be a complete intrusion 
on our on our, on our so-called uh, desire to be a separate individual. So the eternal consciousness that you are born from is unending, no beginning, no end of expanding love and ecstasy. So I, I, I totally hold space for a lot of beautiful spiritual people to say, yes, you know, the, the, the universe built, it, uh, built itself to understand itself. And what I get so much bliss from sharing with people is that, you know, first of all, I always, um, you know, I, I always start off with this. I am not an intellectual. I'm humbled by what I don't know. No, one me, of my me greatest neither. Assets, we got that in common. <laughs> I'm not an intellectual one of my either. Greatest, yeah, you know, one of my greatest assets is that I have a very childlike quality. I have a very... Um, I'm, some call me very naive, and um, in a world such as ours, a lot of people protect themselves very guardedly, and I, I don't. I, I choose to live a life inspired and to live a life completely aware of, of my spirit soul. So to answer that really good point you are saying about, you know, did God create this to understand itself? They are three powerful, distinct energies the Supreme has. And it's, 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 it's akin to understanding the layers of God. So once we understand these layers, we can better refine our questions. The first energy of God um, is called the impersonal Brahman. It's ubiquitous. It's cosmic. It's unending creational fractal of the multiverse that Mahavishnu is dreaming. And when we left God, we, God didn't leave us. God apparently came with us as the super soul or the para-atman, the consciousness within every single atom, and the other observer or the, the other a, a companion in the heart of every living being. And that's called the para-atman. So the first layer, you have Brahman, the, the ubiquitous cosmic energy of God, the external energy. Then in the, the second part, you have the para-atman or the super soul, the source of all esotericism. But the third energy is who you are, the eternal soul, the atman, in relation to the eternal omnipotence, uh, ever joyful, ever um, sovereign being with God. So these three layers constitute our reality. And most people, I would say 99% of people, only conceive of God as being energy, the Brahman. And this is why the Vedas, Veda means knowing, by the way. God is not a Hindu. The Vedas are not only just for Indian-bodied people. Veda means absolute. Like mathematics are absolute. You can go to any one university and learn trigonometry, algebra, things like this. It's absolute. Mathematics is absolute. Well, wouldn't you know, God is also absolute. He's beyond our preconceived notions of bodily designation, religion, and politic. Yeah, it's but, you know what's cool, though, about I, that, too, real quick, I want to say is, like, I remember when I went to college, I was, you know, they make you take prerequisites or whatever, and I had uh, world religion. And I had, uh, for some reason, I'd been brought up to think that Judaism was the oldest religion. But it's not. It's the Hindu it's the vedas that stuff is the oldest that is the when it comes to our history what we can really trace back that has the oldest history to it so i think that's pretty fascinating as well a lot of a lot of the you know a lot of the uh, western occultists like manly p hall said well you know the he claimed this he said the christians got their stuff from the jews the jews got their stuff from the egyptians the egyptians got their stuff from the brahmins right and it's like hmm so why don't we just like reading that well that's some pretty deep stuff man it sounds like you know your stuff you've been you really do well first of all i i really like you <laughs> um you're you're very comfortable to talk to and when i really you know invite someone i can just free associate to the cows come home and i know we we only have a you know two hours so i won't go on forever but this knowledge of the self the Vedas say it's the homo sapien birthright. It's the human birthright to have this knowledge. And a bit of context about that is we leave Krishna, oh, sorry, God, 
as Brahma, an engineer of our own universe. These Vedas are so inconceivably conceptual that it, it really, it really, it's supposed to humble you. The idea of knowledge is to completely polish the heart, to remind you where you are in the body, and to remind you what you're not. You're, you're not that, that brain within your, in your skull that's trying to figure out this matrix. And demigods, the Vedas explain that there are billions and billions of demigods, different personalities that uphold certain functions of the multiverse. And wouldn't you know, um, a lot of religions on our earth are exopolitical. You know, you mentioned Manly P. Hall. I'm really good friends with Jordan Maxwell. Oh, yeah. He's one of my dear, he's one of my dear friends. And uh, it's so funny you mentioned Manly P. Hall. My role uh, with Jordan right now is to synthesize where he's at in his life now is to understand how it relates to the Vedas. And I'm humbled by that, that role uh, and to help guide him into, into more advanced people who know what they're talking about. Um, be, you know, erudite philosophers, Vaishnavas, people who have dedicated their entire lives to this. And so it's so funny how he was the beginning point of my awakening, by the way. It's so interesting. And many years later, nature or the universe had, uh, or the Paraatman, the super soul, uh, has guided me to be of small service for Jordan. And so Manly P. Hall, um, you know, he, he I, did some very interesting stuff going on with him. Yeah. That, was, uh, George, that was Jordan's, um, one of his main teachers. They were very close. And I can't reveal some of the things that Jordan said. But can I just tell you, Manly P. Hall, quote unquote, may not have been from this world. I yeah, people, I people want to, people, I've had, I've talked to Jordan Maxwell a few times, actually, probably three or four times on this show and on another radio show he used to do. And his, I, I think I might have asked him that once about Manly. I was like, how did this guy in his 20s, mind you, you can hear some of his lectures when he was in his 20s, I think it was like late 20s, know more about uh, esoteric, occult, hidden meanings, the mysteries than any person alive where did i mean there's been a lot of people that have went on uh you know knowledge quests don't get lot, tons of people they were born into money they got to go on knowledge quests their whole life and still didn't have the information he did it, i always thought that there was something about him like that you know i um yes he yeah I, again i was so close to revealing something that i promised i wouldn't but a lot of people you know what i've learned I used to live at an extraterrestrial ranch in Washington, uh, at SETI. I used to live there for uh, three seasons. I, and I, I know, I know it, it, it takes a lot of earnesty to admit this, but I think there's a lot of people that walk among us that may not be human. And uh, it, it took me a while to really kind of um, appropriately sift through that and be very cautious in my approach of thinking like that. but. I really think that we share this planet with old, with other multidimensional beings, and I think some of them are far more, far much more older than we are. You know, uh, Mount Adams, for example. We every night we would see multidimensional vehicles and beings appear on that mountain, and I've seen the same beings on Mount Shasta. So, this is a multidimensional planet, and. Um, it takes a lot of arrogance and conceit to think that, well, just because something's not proven to me, that means it doesn't exist. There's a lot of arrogance there. And I like paradoxes, you know, two conflicting ideas that are still true. And right. I, I my, one of my things is, yes, I don't understand this, but my gosh, my heart is open to learn more. And people like Manly P. Hall, who had the consciousness to, to, to benefit, to give knowledge to people that was his operandi that was his you know motivation. Yeah, his whole life yeah a complete um knowledge in the base of altruism you know and that's exactly what the vedas are i mean look at nikolai tesla he was obsessed with the sri upanishadic vedas he 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 was trying to tell us so much and um unfortunately you know we, we know what happened to him but um 
you know, I, I'd love to tell you why Earth-like planets are so special, if I may. Well, actually, you know what? That's a good place to leave off because we've got to take a break because I do feel like, honestly, just like as we started this uh, this talk, that we are on a, in a very special place compared to all of the rocks and all of the places in the universe. This is definitely a special place. I believe that 100%. And I do want to hear what you have to say about that, but we are up against our first break. We are here with Sean Cannon tonight. We'll open the phones up in the second hour. Lighting the Void is the name of the show. If you're just tuning in, we talk about all things in the void. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is Crow Triple Seven, and you are listening to The Fringe FM. Hey, this is country music singer and void walker Jason Benoit. And when I need my fix on the world of magic and the capabilities of the human consciousness, I listen to Joe Roop right here on Lighting the Void Radio. This is Barbara Charlton from Metaphorical Archaeology. If you've ever had a traumatic paranormal experience, the effects of it may stay with you for years. Uh, Who do you talk to? You can't go to conventional help. What we do is we use emotional freedom techniques or tapping to actually neutralize the effects of that event. Maybe when you tell the story now, your heart races and your palms get sweaty. You don't even want to think about it because you don't know how to neutralize that. That's what EFT tapping does does it neutralizes those emotions the circuit that that was recorded on is gone the energy flows freely and you're free of it and that's what emotional freedom is all about we offer this as a pro bono service but this is something that i offer because no one it seems is helping people with these experiences if you'd like to reach me it's really easy my cell phone is 214-995-3754 please leave a message i will get back to you as quickly as possible or you can email me barb.eft at gmail.com and eft stands for emotional freedom techniques reach out to me it's confidential this works you won't believe this. right me old chinas i know it's an ad break but before you lot shoot off and make yourself a cup of rosy lee or whatever else it is you're going to sling down your gregory peck you need to listen to me bubble if like me you found your way to light in the void via a downloadable podcast you might want to take a butchers at the fringe fm wind and Collect. You won't Adam and Eve how many other shows there are or what they rabbit on about. Ancient history, conspiracy, the consciousness, the esoteric, the occult, metaphysics, parapolitical, ufology, technology and spirituality to name but a few. They got featured hosts like Ryan Gable, Jeremy Scott, Alex Exum, Tim Doyle, Cortana and Gigi, Susanna Ross, the Reverend John Polk, Michael Deacon and J.D. Lewis. You might find yourself listening to the thoughts and feelings of the author of The Fish You Just Finished Reading. Or you could pick up the dog and bone, call in and tell everyone your own beliefs or experiences. So do me a favour. Before you put on the ansel or crack open a bottle of vino or roller joint, go to the Fringe FM and see what you're missing. From a cave in the depths of your mind, it's lighting the void with Joe Root. The Fringe FM isn't just a radio station. We also provide services for all your audio production needs. If you are interested in live radio or pre-recorded podcasts, we're here to help. We even do audio enhancements and voiceovers if needed. If you want to do a podcast or live radio show and even want the option to syndicate on terrestrial radio from simple audio file enhancement to live production and call screening, we have you covered. We have worked with some of the best professionals in the business in order to provide coaching instruction for content creation, show structure, and more. Contact The Fringe Digital Media for more at info at thefringe.fm. That's info at thefringe.fm. Or call 501-777-5631 for a consultation. Hey, I'm J.M. DeBoard, and when I want to talk about dreams, I look up my man Joe Root and his show, Lighting the Void.
Okay, welcome back to Lighting the Void. Tonight, our guest, Sean Cannon, here is with us. And you can go to his website, seanjohncannon.com. It's got some really cool artwork on the front of it where he does pop art and other things as well. There's murals, photography, illustrations, and paintings. And we were talking about the Vedas before the break, and then, like, right before we had to take the break, you were saying, you know, I want to tell you why Earth is such a... Uh, unique and special planet and so i want to hear this and thanks for coming on the show again absolutely uh thank you so much for having me so i speak i try to uh speak in the path of least resistance i try to speak uh in a very quick and to the point and concise way um because a lot of this stuff is very conceptual and so what the vedas explain is um because of the, the multi-dimensional aspect of the of the universe, they are beautifully um, situated heavenly realms, uh, and infinite number of demigods reside within them. And there are also worlds that are the complete opposite. They are worlds be- beneath Earth that are so hellish that um, souls there it, it's it's inconceivable for them to even contemplate divinity. And the heavenly realms most demigods are very narcissistic or they want to lord it over the material multiverse. They want to own different star systems and terraform them and make us in their image. Sound familiar? You know, like the book of Genesis says. Right. And if we leave God, assuming ourselves to be a separate individual, there's no limit to how that could unfurl, how it could unfold. And so if Krishna showed up in the higher dimensions, demigods, first of all, their illusions would get destroyed. And, you know, Krishna can't go to the worlds lower than Earth because, you know, there's so much suffering. They, they wouldn't have the understanding to even contemplate the divinity. So Earth is like the perfect frequency. It's like a perfect cymatica of light and dark, of, of high vibration and low vibration. And... That's what the third dimension is all about. The third dimension is learning. Some souls actually deliberately come to planets like this to learn that abstract idea of light and dark. And it's because we enjoy and suffer appropriately, the Vedas and the avatars of God. By the way, they are unlimited avatars of Krishna. There's so many. Um, That's why the avatar is Lord Buddha is Krishna, Lord Rama, uh, Lord Nisringa, all these different aspects of God, they can appear on earth like planets. And did you know that the knowledge that is gifted to the humans, because we suffer so much and enjoy appropriately, we're given knowledge that even the demigods don't know. So God plays fairly. In other words, if you want to go be in the Pleiades or, you know, whatever higher celestial abode and be in the fifth, tenth dimension and enjoy there or whatever, It doesn't necessarily mean, I think many of us take for granted that because these beings are on a higher level, they know everything, and that actually is not true. So God reveals himself absolutely with a capital A on Earth-like planets. The Vedas explain there's like 60 billion Earth-like planets just in the spiral arm of our galaxy alone, and Krishna has been on every one of them. And uh, he performs pastimes. So this is getting to the point of why Earth-like planets are so special. When God appears, there's like an energetic reverberation out that extends outward into the universe that captures the attention of demigods. And many of them situated in their respective dimensional realms, they witness the absolute perform his inconceivable pastimes. And this is what the Srimad Bhagavatam Veda of India it's uh, 18, uh, sorry, it's, uh, well, the Mahabharata is 18,000 verses, but the Srimad Bhagavatam is 13, 14 cantos of multidimensional reality um, gifted to the humankind through reception of sound mantra and written um, oral history through the incarnation of the Asudeva. So Earth-like planets, capture the attention of demigods or ETs, whatever you want to um, call them. And some of them do not understand this energy that is the absolute. His energy is so incomprehensible, but he still captures their attention. So many of them come here and they go, why on earth does this 
being choose these cockroaches? I mean, we're cockroaches to many uh, ETs. You know, we of the DARPA ones. You know, we're, we're just batteries. You know, we're, we're 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 energy. We're just cattle. You know, look how human beings treat cattle and animals for consumption. Well, ETs do that to us, as above, so below. So there's a lot of uh, a mirroring effect, I would say. So this planet has seen every advent of the avatars of Lord Krishna, Lord Titania, Lord Krishna and Radharani, um, Lord Rama, which was 1.3 million years ago, and Lord Buddha. And when these avatars appear, like I was just saying, they cause an energetic reverberation outward into the multiverse that captures the demigod's attention. So as, as when Lord Buddha appeared, you know, the mission of Lord Buddha, it's Krishna. It's actually, Buddha was an expansion of Shiva, and Shiva is an eternal expansion of Vishnu. And the, the role of the Buddha was to trick Mayavad philosophers, atheists, tricking them into being compassionate without any Vedic ritual because they were killing animals left and right. Ahimsa, you know, nonviolence. And uh, the, so when the Buddha appeared, devas appeared, devas, demigods, and the Buddha let them very much know, no, 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 I'm, I'm here for the human kind. You have to sit in the back. So even, even demigods get humbled. And when Lord Krishna appeared 5,000 years ago, oh, my God, the Srimad Bhagavatam explains how all these demigods were trying to mess with him. They were trying to figure him out. And, it, you know, that coyote well, and the Didn't he appear, cartoon, doesn't, the, doesn't the story say that he appeared in, in blue skin, right? Like, so he kind of stuck out to begin with, right? Krishna? Yeah, and by the way, that's his eternal, um, when God appears, he appears as one of us. So his body is not made of vessels and capillaries and skeleton and muscle. His body is made of what the soul is made from, eternality, knowledge, and bliss. And that's why his energy is so magnanimous, and, and that's why it casts out into the multiverse. That's in, You know what's really so, crazy, too? There was a <clears throat> kid that had an experience where he saw Jesus or whatever, and I remember... Uh, reading that story and the kid said that he saw Jesus kind of like Christ sitting on a throne. And then, uh, that the father was on another throne and their parents asked the kid, they said, well, what, what did God look like? And he said, well, God didn't really have a, a human form. It was just this blue energy, like a blue cloud of energy. Isn't that crazy? The, the Vedas explained that if you were to look at Krishna directly, it would, it would be as if 22, I don't know why it says 22 billion, but it's as if 22 billion suns appeared before you. You know, the, the, the spiritual realm is self-illuminating. <laughs> Every single aspect of God there is self-realized. There's well, more creation in the spiritual world than there is in the multiverse. And every single one of those entities is self-realized. Now, are you speaking about this from study or your own personal experience? I mean, have you had some experiences with these realms? I uh, I have been blessed to have experiences with Krishna that humbled my brain. In other words, my brain was trying to understand it, but the only place I could surrender to it was my heart. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been blessed. I've been, I've been blessed to have many um, experiences with Krishna. How did that happen? Did that happen in meditation or dream form? Or how did that, how did you, so yeah. The greatest asset that the homo sapien, the humankind that we have, is our lips, tongue, roof of our mouth, and throat chakra. We are given the facility to recite a sound vibration, mantra. Man means mind. Thra means get out of your mind. So we are given the sound vibration of God. And when you're sincerely reciting um, a mantra, you are in the path of least resistance to God. You know, they say, like, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, this is why the, the human form is so powerful, is because we have the facility to chant sound vibrations that are 
God manifested in sound. Uh, are you familiar with uh, cymatics? Yes. Yeah, I am very familiar. So we can see self-evidently that sound affects matter, and the Vedas say spirit animates matter. You know, we're 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 spirits animating bodies. That that's what we're that's our business here in, in the universe, and so. There are times that I, I've chanted the, it's a Hare Krishna mantra, and it's a 5,000-year-old love song of God in the heart. And uh, I have been blessed to go deep with the sound vibration. And the point of the mantra is to uncover your eternal self with a capital S. The self is the soul. And... The Paraatman, the super soul that's also located in your heart chakra, by the way, that's where God is. So God is very far. He's in the spiritual world beyond the, the multiverse, and he's also very near. He's within your heart. This is what Yeshua, the Pleiadian Yeshua, I think he was a Pleiadian if you read the Bible, uh, the book of um, Job. Uh, 3831, can thou loose the bands of Orion? That's where the Egyptians came from. And can thou gain the influence of the Pleiades? And yeah. I think that's indicating where Yeshua came from. And I, Yeshua came here, I believe, to learn about the Father, Krishna, to learn about the kingdom of God within you, the super soul. Yeah, Job and also so, talks about, uh, AC, can you, uh, something about, can you release the powers of Maseroth too, which is the Zodiac, which is all 12 signs of the Zodiac as well. So do you feel, do you feel like the 12 apostles of, of Jesus are the 12 houses of the Zodiac? And that's why the yeah. theology was forbidden in the Bible. I yeah. definitely do because I've learned it through Rosicrucian study that, that there's the, there's actually, um, what's called the shoe bread, a candlestick where you can put the candles. There's 12 candles and each sign of the Zodiac that corresponds to each tribe of Israel that also corresponds to each of the apostles as well, too. And it's a definitely, like, it's, yeah, I totally do, 100%. Isn't it incredible how certain religions put you into a shoebox and you're not allowed to know anything else but that shoebox that you put into, whereas the Vedas are the complete opposite. The Veda, knowing. Veda means knowing. Veda, you can't believe in Veda. Like, you can't believe in yoga. The greatest gift that, that these avatars have gifted us is yoga. The science of knowing the difference between what is um, spiritual substance versus material nature. So, we're, again, we're given the body, a human body, with which we have the facility to have discernment. And notice, it's a science. You know, science means essentially that means that 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 becomes self-evident yoga is the original religious principle of 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 endeavoring for god and uh and notice like it's not a it's not a belief system it's a doing system it's in doing that we know not necessarily being reliant on blind faith and blind faith can be be compromised in many different ways can't it look at our history like how we have so many different, varying, incomprehensible uh, governments. You know, government in Latin, govern, control, meant, mind, government. You know, these things seem to want to keep us batteries, to keep us um, cattle, if you will, in a paradigm for control. And um, the, the Vedas and the avatars come forth to... I mean, this is what the Bhagavad Gita is. Arjuna is a hybrid. Arjuna of the Bhagavad Gita, he's a human and an E.T. His dad was an E.T. He was a Manu, the progenitor of mankind, who fell in love with a female earth uh, I mean, people want proof of E.T.s. I say, folks, get the Bhagavad Gita as it is. It's all in there. But it's so confidential, no one really knows about it. Why is it confidential? Because it's for the heart-centric people. It's for it, it's supposed to be understood by people who don't want to exploit the material energy of God. The, the Vedas explain 
that for every single drop of water in an ocean, from the Pacific Ocean, from Australia to Japan to Alaska, for every single drop of water, that's how many wives you've had in this multiverse. You know, the Dalai Lama once said that when he was asked about karma, he said, you know, that's the one thing I don't understand. Well, Krishna says, he reveals to Arjuna, in the Matrix, by the way, Morpheus is Krishna and Neo is Arjuna. Neo in India, neophyte, means one who seeks truth. Yeah. And so Krishna reveals to Arjuna, Arjuna, you've never not existed, and you have so much activity associated with your incarnations that you've forgotten them all, but I remember every one of them. And um, so, but what do you so, think yeah. about like? What do you think about? Uh, you know how you hear people say soul families and star seeds and all that stuff. Man, I, I really used to be really skeptical about that until certain things started happening in my life where I start running into people. It's like whoa, like where you can literally look into their eyes and you know you know them. That's a trip, man. You know, and I've always wondered about that. I've heard a lot of theories. Yeah, it's a very visceral feeling, isn't it? Yeah. And it's it's a sensation that isn't logic. You know, I I have a lot of empathy for our brains because our brains are designed. Look, you have two hemispheres in your skull, a quantum computer and the other hemisphere is the here and now. Talk about a duality. I, I, have a, I hold a lot of space for, for the brain because this brain really thinks it's the be-all and end-all. But there's, the, the true governance within you is the heart. And as you probably um, are noticing, our planet's going through a shift, uh, an incredible solar event in India. It's called the Sambartika fire. And in the Bible, it's called the return of the Son of God, S-U-N, the light of the world, the risen ball of light that rises every morning the second event of the solar son of God. So when I just heard you say that, as these energies are shifting, viscerally, I think we're connecting in ways that we're not necessarily used to, but it's still very familiar. Right. We may have forgotten it, but we're we're, we're reclaiming that that intelligence that's seated within us. And when you say star seeds, oh my gosh, what motivates me? What motivates me is that there are so many great souls on this planet that I I, I actually get transcendental anxiety, not because I'm advanced. I'm I'm probably one of the most flawed people I know, but I've seen great souls. In India, they're called Mahatma. Mahatma is Maha, great, Atma, and soul. And there's innumerable. I can't count them all. And a lot of star seeds come to this planet, I think, to one, um, help Prakriti, Mother God, uh, Mother the Earth, the Earth Mother. Their name is in India called Prakriti. I think many souls have incarnated to hold a frequency for this planet. I think a lot of souls come here to to become liberated because, again, what I was trying to say earlier, just because you're in a higher dimension, it doesn't mean that you're on the path to liberation. Because even demigods can see God is just energy, Brahman. So it's only on Earth-like planets where you can understand the three layers of God that I was explaining earlier. And I think the third um, reason why there's a lot of star seeds here, I think a lot of souls are rekindling with other souls from other journeys. And it's like Earth is like a cosmic Greyhound bus station where we can all meet up and play out our own divine leelas. I think that's why we created the Internet. You know, people are like, oh, the internet and this and that. I'm like, you know how many awesome people I met because of the internet that I would have never met just if it didn't exist? Now we can reach out and talk to anybody right now. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it, it's, you know, it's a very auspicious time to be human. I feel that we have a solar event that it's not going to happen. We're in the throes of it. You know, it's almost like a download. It's like, yep, we're at 60%. You know, we've, we've, it, it started in 2012. It wasn't the end. It was the beginning of this, this incredible solar event. And um, and so I realized, like I was just um, saying earlier, all I have now is just my heart space. 
and surrendering. Uh, in India, it's called sharanagati, uh, to surrender your false notions and to surrender to the will of the divine. And it's very delicious. It's very beautiful um, to, to go into that consciousness that, you know, it's not outside of you, it's within you. And I think the Internet, like you're nicely explaining, it's connecting so many people in ways that, you know, we can't, you know, we, we can't comprehend it, yet we can still do it, you know. I've had so many synchronistic events that happened in my life in the past year. It's crazy. But I've also went through just these really tough transformations. It's crazy as well. So when I read these astrologers, and now I hear you're talking about this too, it's just beyond, there's way too many signs that there is definitely something trying to either it's trying to advance us whether we want to or not i mean if we're a lot of us are going right now I, I feel like kicking and screaming like you would if you're trying to put uh, a cat in a toilet you know like they just don't want to do it and it's <laughs> you know what i mean and it's like until you surrender to that there's just it's this karmic suffering that you're feeling until you just like break that cycle and surrender to it i'm dealing with it too and i just had to walk just for an hour straight to try to shake off some old junk, you know, but it works. Like I start for some reason when I, I start to expand energy or create or create or do anything like that, it starts to release it, you know. And isn't it funny how many of us don't understand that we don't have to do this on our own. The, the most confidential aspect of the Bhagavad Gita, what Krishna reveals to Arjuna is actually the most confidential knowledge. This is how Krishna is within every heart chakra as the, as the super soul. And we don't have to do anything on our own. We choose to do things on our own because we choose to remain in, should we say, the, the fog. And what the Vedas of India are trying to reveal to us is that you are actually not alone. You are the super soul of the cosmic internet resides within your heart. I don't think Masons know about this. I don't think certain um, uh, royal lineages on our planet know about this. Um, that's how confidential it is. And uh, as you know, as you're going on your walks, the Vedas explain that like, you can contemplate the supreme personality of God through sound yeah. and collaborate. Make your life a collaboration. You know, when, when Thoreau, um, when Emerson read the Bhagavad Gita, he dropped the book and he went into nature and he said, oh my God, literally, because he understood where are you not? You know, God is covered. The material the multiverse covers God because we wanted separation. And it's through sound that you unlock the darshana. Darshana means to see God. We unlock the darshana within our heart through sound. So that's probably the most um, relevant thing I could ever say to you, is that you can choose to continue your life forward, trying to figure out and put it all together, or you can recite certain mantras where you're connecting with everyone and every living being in conjunction with the Supreme person. Sounds amazing, huh? <laughs> yeah, it does. It sounds cool. Actually, it does sound amazing. I, uh, wanted to, so I want to get into this, uh, talk with you here cause we're up against it at the top of the hour, uh, about the ET thing, because, um, m man, I almost gave up on it until I met Tim Doyle from UFO seekers. Cause there's just so much, so many stories, so many people coming around trying to, um, well, you know, you didn't, you didn't know what to believe in it. And I've always thought that this ET thing had something to do that went back to the Brahmins and everything like that as well. And then a lot of people think that too. And I wanted to talk to you about that uh, when we come back, because I know that you've had some experiences of your own, right? Uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff. Yeah, I've, I've been very, I've been very lucky. But right on. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. We'll be right back after this short message and news please support the show if you can join our membership and patreon grab something from the shop join the outsiders for free we'll be right back more lighting the void coming up
I'm Clyde Lewis. You are listening to The Fringe FM. Alex X. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Hey, this is No Way Jose, a Northern California Piscean stuck in the Arizona desert. I'm a void walker, and I got the shoes to prove it. So what do I do when my soul yearns to delve deep into the realm of the unknown? I aim my satellite straight into the night sky and catch a smooth ride on the KTLK DB radio waves. I tune into Lighting the Void with Joe Root on the French FM. Joe, Lighting the Void is the best show on the planet. This is Barney, your friend from Facebook. Thank you and all the crew for all you do. Namaste, my friend. This is Megan from the Foothills, North Carolina, and I am a board walker. G'day, board walkers. This is Lily from Down Under Australia. The world may be small, but Nick Murray is great. So let your curiosity take you for a journey with Joe Root. Hey, this is V, coming in from Central Maryland, and I am a void walker. This is Kevin Darkerty, a beginner void walker. I'm from Vancouver, BC. I know a little about a lot, and you know, as Leonard Skinner said, I guess the rest. I learned a lot from uh, Mr. Root in the show. And I uh, heard it from the beginning. I knew right then he was going to be a new art bell. Thanks for all your uh, shows, and keep it up. Hey, this is Derek from Mass, a.k.a. the Night Stalker, and I'm a void walker. This is Mark from Chicago, and I walk the void to ascertain what is consciousness. My name is Jared Johnson, and I'm from Humboldt County, California. I do not know all the answers to the questions about reality. I do not claim to know the ultimate truth about life. I seek that which has been made hidden as a part of a family of explorers of consciousness. I'm a void walker. Thanks, Jaru. Have you ever seen an ad or banner which brought you a feeling that someone is reading your mind or even listening to your conversations? Your online data is being used against you. Surfshark is a VPN service that makes online privacy protection easy and attainable. You can use it on as many devices as you'd like simultaneously. Surfshark encrypts all internet traffic sent to and from your devices and ensures that your IP address remains hidden. The VPN service that we use at UFO Seekers plus one month free for $1.99 a month. Visit surfshark.deals/seekers. Please listen. Now is not the time to fear. When your immune system is strong, shields up. You have very little worries. If your immune system is compromised, you're susceptible to all viruses. I say shields up and no fear. Try Heart Love from GetTheTea.com. Heart Love has a special ingredient called allicin. It comes from the healing part of the garlic plant. No garlic breath. No garlic leaking out your pores. Just pure immune building ingredients that gets your shields up. Heart Love is a unique blend of herbs that loves to build you up. Google garlic and know the benefits. One Heart Love pill is equal to 20 cloves of garlic. 20 cloves. Shields up. You've heard of our life change cleansing tea at getthetea.com. Now try Heart Love. And by the way, take your blood pressure and watch weekly what happens. So here's how to purchase. Log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. And build your shields. That's getthetea.com. Mention Ray in the coupon code and hit apply and receive free shipping. This is Malorcas45, fan of the Fridge FM, challenging everyone to open their mind's eye. Listen to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop to gain precision for your third eye vision. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. 
It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard. Available at OrangeGuard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Hey, French listeners. This is Dave Cruz, host of Beyond the Strange Radio, asking you to join us live Sunday evenings at 7 p.m. Pacific Time, 10 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Fringe FM. Visit beyondstrange.com for links to chat, social media, and schedules of the show. And remember, always stay strange. Hasta. Somewhere between abnormal and paranormal, there's a show called Into the Paranormal. I'm Jeremy Scott. Hear me live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern on The Fringe FM. For abnormal news, I'm Brad Bernards. Science Alert reports that astronomers have finally classified a tremendous space explosion, first noticed in 2018, an event so bright it was thought to have originated much closer than we eventually realized. It now belongs to an entirely new class of giant space explosions. These bursts of energy are extremely powerful and extremely fast, blasting vast amounts of matter into space at intense velocities. Astronomers have named the new class Fast Blue Optical Transients, or FBOTs. The 2018 event, nicknamed the COW, was eventually traced to a galaxy 200 million light years away, which was a surprise given its exceptional brightness. Since then, it's been outstripped by two even bigger explosions of the same kind, bringing the total of known F-bots to three. To put it into perspective just how intense these explosions are, the COW was at least 10 times more powerful than a regular supernova. Astronomers have discovered an activity cycle in another fast radio burst, potentially unearthing a significant clue about these mysterious deep space phenomena, according to a report in Space.com. Fast radio bursts, or FRBs, are extragalactic flashes of light that pack a serious wallop. Potential explanations range from merging super-dense neutron stars to advanced alien civilizations. In January of this year, astronomers reported that one member of the repeater class appears to exhibit a 16-day activity cycle. It fires off bursts for a four-day stretch, then goes quiet for 12 days, and then starts all over again. Connect with the news at paraabnormalradio.com. I'm Brad Bernards, Paraabnormal News. Okay, welcome back to Lighting the Void. We're in our second hour now. The phone lines are open. If you've got a question for our guest tonight, Sean Cannon, you can call in at 1-800-588-0335. Any question about the Vedics or star seeds or aliens, right? But I do want to, just talking during the break, I want to ask uh, Sean a question here. So I, 
You know, I was telling you during the break that I study uh, Western ceremonial magic, the Western esoteric mystery tradition, all of that stuff. And, uh, you know, I was studying this Gnostic book by this guy named Samuel Omeyor, which I, I used to think the guy was a complete nut, but when I would, would read his books, I was like, oh, this is some interesting stuff. Uh, and so you said that Veda means knowing. It's not like a religion. It just means knowing, right? So Gnostic or Gnosticism is kind of like the same thing uh, to know. And But anyways, like reading, he has this book called Practical Astrology, and I read it, and it's about doing mantras. And you're, I'm thinking, well, what do mantras have to do with astrology? So at certain times, you would face certain constellations or even planets, things like that, but constellations mainly. And he would have you do a mantra. And as you would do the mis- meditation and mantra, you would also move your head in a certain way. Uh, I guess there was some yogic quality to that. And he said that it would launch you, your astral body, to these constellations. Now, here's the, here's the weird thing. When you look at the Tree of Life uh, or any Western tradition system, they have the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life that's behind it. And, you know, when you study masonry, they say, what's the password? Yakin, Boaz, all that stuff. Well, he's saying that they're being trained up because if they ever make it to these internal realms and they realize that they can launch themselves to these places with their astral bodies, that they're actually going to meet these temples, which are, you know, they used to call them internal temples, but they're really what's internal and external when it's just consciousness. And you would have to know these passwords. Do you have any thoughts on that? Does that relate to any of your studies at all? Well, my gosh, I my reflection on that is you're you're giving a lot of credence to the to the powerful um, reality of mantra sound vibration, and uh, there were, there's yogis in India that can leave their body go as, as small as an atom and expand as as large as the universe. So, <laughs> you know. And it has to be done with precision. You know, a lot of these meditators are fixing their consciousness beyond the limits of the mind. And it's the sound vibration, the the connecting to the sound vibration. This is why there's a lot of mantra emphasis in Krishna consciousness or in Buddhism, the om, the sound. So the the sound is the lock and key uh, to expanding the unlimited potential that you are. And since this is eternal knowledge, like you were just nicely saying about Veda, Veda means knowing. It's not believing. Um, Veda means expanding eternal knowledge into the here and now. And so a lot of people, they want to journey to other planets, other star nations, or their other universes, and that's their their right to do so. Um, But there's tapasya or a sacrifice that has to be done. You have to give up something in order to pursue that. And uh, are you are you familiar with the the Vedic um, the, the the time cycles that that we have? Uh, a little bit, yeah. The uh, what are they called? Kali Yugas, isn't that what they're called? Yeah, we're um, we're in an age called the Kali Yuga, which began five thousand years ago uh, mm. when Krishna left. The, the Kali Yuga began, and it lasts for four hundred thirty-two thousand years. And there's four, you know, the four Gospels of the Bible are actually the four time cycles of the Vedas. And in contrast to the Western concept of linear time, the sacred texts of India view reality from the perspective of cycles or yugas. And um, our current cycle of history is seen as one of many stages that recur eternally. These ages turn into new ages and then back again. And nature always hints of this throughout life. You know, the seasons repeat themselves, the days of the week reoccur, uh, day turns into night and then day and, and so forth. So everything is secular. It's not linear. I'm, I'm, what I'm going on about is um, we have to understand the mechanics of what we're dealing with in terms of Veda to understand ultimately where we want to go. And, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, did you know that the, the Brahma Samhita Veda, which is the, the sound mantra of Brahma creating our universe, it's 311 trillion years old. Really? That's the Vedic calculation. It's, it's in the trillions, not billions, folks. It's in the trillions. We have limited imperfect senses, and I hate to say it, we have limited imperfect current instruments. 
Veda is beyond linear thinking. It, you know, linear is very third-dimensional thinking. So the multidimensionality of Veda and application of parampara knowledge, parampara means disciplic, unchanged knowledge. And, uh, and that's why it's so powerful, because it's unchanged. Like, I've seen 7,000 versions of the Bhagavad Gita, but there's only one I'll read. And that's the parampara version because it's as it is. You know, that's why it's called that. So, yes, you can go to any star system you want. You can go to that. You don't need DMT to go there, folks, either. You, you can go to air and sound. But we have inherited this form. We have inherited this star system. And I think many of us want to go home. And that's our birthright. And um, so, yeah. You know, this is not esoteric, by the way. And as you know, there's exoteric and esoteric. Now, exoteric means 500 people believe a story, and esoteric means five people know the real truth. You know, and so this is beyond all of that duality. And um, do you know about the um, Druva Loka or the North, the North Pole Star? Just the mythologies around it. But, yeah, go ahead. There is, um, in the Vedas of ancient India, they describe how every single, you know, for all the grains of sand on earth, I want folks to really think about this. For, this is what the Vedas say. Of all the grains of sand on earth, that's how many stars are in our galaxy. Did you know that if you shrunk our sun and its system down to the size of a white blood cell, our galaxy would fit into the continental size of the USA? It's, a, it's, it's the Vedas explain that the Brahman energy of God, the external energy of God, the multiverse, is incomprehensible. It will never be understood. Um, it will never be understood. That's why we're dealing with paradoxes in, in the third dimension. But the, the Vedas say that the, um, the ancient texts of India describe how every single star is conscious, and there's a residing solar deity within every single star. And there are infinite multidimensional beings residing in them. And according to the Srimad Bhagavatam of Lord Krishna, of all the star nations in our local area of our galaxy, Druvaloka is the most revered. And if, guys, if, if, uh, if people Google this, Google Druva Nakshatra, a movable star. And you'll notice that the North Star never moves, but stars circumambulate it. But it just so happens that a devotee of Lord Vishnu resides there. His name is Dhruva. And he was one of the most incredible devotees of Lord Vishnu. So much so, the solar deities, um, they want to have his blessings. They want to, they want to emulate him in his devotion to, to Krishna or Vishnu. And so, you know, like the swastika. Did you know that the swastika is actually the Big Dipper moving around the North Star in the four seasons of summer, spring, winter, and fall. And that's what the swastika is. Right. It's yeah. the Big Dipper. And did, did you know that in each one of those stars of the Big Dipper, it's called the Seven Sages. People can Google this. 10.6, opulence of the absolute, Bhagavad Gita as it is. Krishna reveals in there the Manu, the progenitors of mankind. And folks, I think this could be the same thing as what Genesis is saying. Come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Krishna reveals to Arjuna the progenitors of mankind, the Manu. And he explains how every single star the, the, of the seven stars in the Big Dipper, there's a deity that, that, that is the residence of that one star within that system. I mean, this is so incomprehensible. Like, a lot of people would just think of the seven star nations of, you know, Pleiadian, Octorius, Andromeda, Sirius, Orion. There's so many other star nations out there. And um, the Vedas um, go so far out to explain in our local area why Druva Loka, the North Pole star, is so significant. And uh, thank you, like you were nicely saying about the Internet, isn't it amazing how people can just go on Google and find all of this stuff? <laughs> yeah, it is. Like we've built this thing 
this uh, collective brain machine where we can talk to each other instantly and get any kind of information that we want instantly. Uh, so, you know, people may look at it as a, like a bad thing, but here's the truth, right? Even though we're locked down, since this lockdown began with COVID, the, the figures are up, especially in Europe. Listeners have gone from tuning in to from 12 hours a week to media to 26 hours a week. I mean, that's more than double the media time. And people are spending more time. People are spending more time on the web. However, there's also an internal like thing going on with people right now. I, I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to right now, Sean, that are talking about uh, they feel like they're stuck. They feel like they're in between worlds. Some people are saying they're losing their mind. Some people are kind of going with it and accepting it. Um, I've definitely felt the energies of having weird dreams. Like we're transitioning for sure. And even the Mayan calendar, if you look at the Gregorian calculations to it, 2012 wasn't really until now, like 2020, according to some figures. Pretty, pretty weird stuff, man. Well, it's really interesting that you talk about that because do you know that we're in Saturn's reign currently? Do you, by the way, do you know about Saturn and Krishna, the, the correlation of Lord of the Rings and Krishna and what happened? I'm, no, I would love to hear this, though, because I'm a big Lord of the Rings nerd. So when Krishna appears in, in on Earth-like planets, duality, like I was saying earlier, he causes an energetic, he captures the attention of the demigods. And infinite demigods situated in their respective dimensional realms were witnessing Krishna perform his pastimes. One, one demigod came in his 20-mile-wide mothership. I mean, this is incredible stuff, folks. He, um, he came uh, to Vrindarvan, India. His name is Lord Shani Dave. And he is Lord of the Rings, Saturn. Now, what people don't understand is that Satan in Hebrew means one who arbitrates you in a court of law. And Saturn represents light and dark, duality, karma, structure, law, restriction, discipline, responsibility, obligation, ambition. And He's also, he has a very monstrous nature, and uh, when he tried to get close to where Krishna, because Krishna appeared like a baby, you know, he, he, he plays the part of, a, of pretending to be a human. This is all divine Leela, by the way. And um, Saturn tried to get close to Krishna, and, and mother, uh, Krishna's mother, uh, Yoshoda, uh, said to the demigods, get rid of this ghastly beast. You know, he's, he's going to scare my kid. And so before he left in his mothership, so, oh, by the way, do you know the Ringmakers of Saturn um, by, by Norman, uh, oh, what's his name? It's called the Ringmakers of Saturn, where um, there's these electromagnetic vehicles the size of Earth making their rings. It's called the Ringmakers of Saturn. People should Google it. But, um, and they can also see images on Google from that book. But anyway, so before he left, in his mothership to go back to his abode, Saturn, he was completely humiliated in front of the view and eye of every single demigod that was witnessing him get humbled. He caused such an energetic disturbance, he conjured the Paraatman or the super soul, Vishnu. And Vishnu essentially says to him, hey man, why are you causing such a disturbance? Why are you behaving like this? And this is where it gets really interesting. He said, Lord, I just wanted to see you. I just wanted to be with you. And it's almost like that George Harrison song, My Sweet Lord. You know, I really want to see you, really want to see you. I'm a terrible singer. But <laughs> it he, gets you know, pretty good. And, I like it, yeah. And no offense to George Harrison. He did it much better. But Oh, he loved Krishna, by the way, George Harrison. But anyway, um, and so what we learned from this pastime, this Vedic pastime, hurt people, hurt others. Demons cause suffering to match their own frequency of suffering. This is really interesting. So Vishnu says to him, I can't change what you've done because it would defy the whole logic of me creating the multiverse. In other words, if I've got to fix what you've done wrong, I have to do it for everyone else. God plays fair. And he says, you can't change what you've done, but there is something I can do for you. This is where it gets really interesting. 
Instead of you being the god of death and suffering, how about you become the demigod of karma? So you can help souls um, kind of get a grip on their lives and they can return home to me much quicker. So Saturn actually, you know, all of our Judaic laws are Saturn. You know, the Kabbalah, um, you know, it's Saturn worship. You know, Islam and, uh, you know, Julius Caesar, he was a Roman. Who did the Romans worship? Saturn. You know, when Julius Caesar, in my humble opinion, commissioned the story of Jesus Christ, I don't think Jesus Christ is the same thing as Yeshua, but that's just my personal belief. Right. You know, it's a death story, isn't it? It's a story about death. What is Saturn? Death. And um, so uh, <clears throat> what we learned from this pastime is that even demigods who are in the mode of darkness or passion have an opportunity to serve Human beings, we don't know what the heck we're doing, we don't know where the hell we're going, and we don't know why the hell we're here. That's our choosing. That doesn't have to be our destiny. We can ask and call forth whomever anyone calls God by whatever name feels resonant, most resonant to them. You can ask the divine to help guide you. Like I was trying to say earlier, life here on earth is supposed to be a collaboration and a cooperation, a collaboration with God and a cooperation with every living being. This is why Vedic practitioners are vegetarian. You know, we don't want to harm any living thing. We understand the soul is the same within every living thing, but the body is different. And it's only in the human form of life that you can comprehend that. A rattlesnake is designed to be a serial killer. It kills. That's how it sustains itself. But it, it's moving up in the evolutionary ladder of consciousness. And by the way, Darwin was only wrong about one thing. The Vedas explain evolution and how Krishna beautifully explains the progression of the soul within spatial form in the Bhagavad Gita. He says, look, Arjuna, when a soul takes a body most suitable to its consciousness and its karma, it desires in that form. So when if a bird wants a bigger beak or a new coloration of feathers or whatever, I as the super soul affect the change within it because I want to make everyone happy. Yeah. God is unbiased. He's, he's equal to all because we're all the same energy of God, but we're all masquerading in different forms. So evolution is the product of consciousness moving about in matter designed by the three modes of material nature. This is very confidential stuff. The three modes of nature that jurisdict consciousness in the multiverse, goodness, Vishnu, passion, Brahma, or ignorance, Shiva. Now, Shiva isn't ignorant. You know, a lot of people are seeing a deity of Shiva at the Large Hadron Collider and going, oh my God, it's the devil. No, guys. Shiva upholds the mode of ignorance. He's not ignorant. Did you know that Shani Devi, actually, Saturn, his, his guru is Shiva? I mean, yeah. I don't think even the occultists know about this stuff, because this is how deeply personal the Vedas are. And if, you, if, you, if you're so fortunate to come in contact with the Vedas, your life is blessed. It begins, because it's, it's absolutely, um, I don't know if this is redundant, but it's absolutely absolute. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of drawn to what you were saying earlier about how, uh, you know, as we go through these transitions and stuff, I think some, some, I can't tell you what it is, but some twisted messed up thing and has psychologically trained us to be like nuclear family style people that believe and transition into these super, like you have to be independent. You can't need help or need anyone or anything like that. I mean, that makes you weak. And it's like, where, where the hell did this come from? Where, where did all this stuff come from where you can't need help from people? Or help is a bad thing, or you need to be super independent and all this. I mean, I don't know well, I, where it came from. I, I think my answer to that is many of us maybe have incarnated on this planet many times over. If we have for every drop of water, that's how many lives we've had in an ocean. We've, we've got a lot of debris in this material world. So I say a lot of us may have got religious trauma 
encoded in our DNA, or in previous lifetimes, we have religious trauma. And when you look at the Bible, what is it? It's light and dark, old and new testaments. You know, in the Old Testament, he's a wrathful, hateful God, and if you don't do what he, you know, and in the New Testament, it's like, oh, my God. You know, so we're dealing with nonstop duality. And once you understand the primer, the nucleus, the foundation of duality, I mean, it's very important that Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, one must understand the difference between me and the infinite demigods that sustain the multiverse. In other words, know the absolute nature of God and the, the exopolitical influences of demigods. I mean, wow. I mean, look at the Egyptians. They're from two star systems, Orion and Sirius. And, uh, you know, they wanted to be worshipped like God. You know, they were very vain, very, I'm not saying all of them were bad, but yeah, they enslaved people. You know, they used us as a commodity. As above, so below. Look what we do to animals. We, we, we do the same to them. So what is the answer? I think the answer is residing to the fact it takes a humble position to arrive at this, this location in your mind. Again, Sharanagati, surrender. To surrender all your false notions about what we think is true and be humble to what we don't know. Right. And... Um, and souls like yourself, who are probably incarnated here to, to get this knowledge, you're on the path. <laughs> right on. I think a lot of us are, too, especially if you're listening to this show. Last break of the night, you're listening to Lighting the Void. I'm your host, Joe Rupert, here with our special guest tonight, who's been filling us full of knowledge, Sean Cannon. Stay with us. We'll be right back. face all over the place we're online 24 7 24 7 you're listening to the hottest internet station listen i want to tell you about gi joy from get the tea.com it's the best alchemical concoction of goodies for your stomach and digestive system i can recommend and that's all based on my experience packed with colostrum acidophilus aloe peppermint and turmeric if you do your own research, then you know this is the bee's knees for the stomach and digestion. Now, due to Big Brother's ears and the eye in the sky, you know I can't go into the details about what it helped me with. All I can say is I got relief. It's non-GMO, no fillers, no preservatives, manufactured right here in the U.S. of A., and delivered to you by the only people who stay on top of the game and are out in front. Go grab a bottle of G.I. Joy at GetTheTea.com and see what all the fuss is about. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. My name is Jake. I'm from Billings, Montana, and I am a Void Walker. Hey, Joe Root. Thanks for lighting the void. This is Janine in the bluegrass of Kentucky, and I am a Void Walker. What's up, guys? This is Damien from San Marcos, Texas, and I'm a Void Walker. I listen to the show to keep myself aligned with the world. Hi, this is Laura, a.k.a. Laura Lavender. I'm from Las Vegas, and I listen to Lighting the Void because it helps me understand some of the strangest experiences I've had. So thanks for all that you do and for always being there for us, Joe. Ever seen an extraterrestrial? It can be hard to believe they exist unless you've seen one for yourself. What if I told you I've seen them my whole life but have never had a witness who shared the encounter with me? Now. 
What if I told you I saw four of them, two with blue skin, and there are over 20 witnesses to this CE5 event? My new book, The Blue Beings, Visitation at the UFO Conference, documents actual accounts from real witnesses, many of which have gone on record to attest to this otherworldly reality. Be a part of the quantum paradigm shift that is taking place right now. Go to johnpolkmedia.com to get your copy of the Blue Beans Visitation at the UFO Conference on sale right now at johnpolkmedia.com. That's J O H N P O L K media.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Hey, this is country music singer and void walker Jason Benoit. And when I need my fix on the world of magic and the capabilities of the human consciousness, I listen to Joe Roop right here on Lighting the Void Radio. Listening to Lighting the Void. The call in number is 1 800 588 0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501 777 5631. Make sure that you also sign up to the outsider at thefringe.fm. Go check out the new website, the new blog post. Really cool content that's going to help you guys out. Uh, especially when you sign up, we're going to be giving you useful stuff, contests, free giveaways, some life hacks. Oh, our buddy and uh, host Dave Cruz put some of his life hacks on there during COVID. So go to sign up to the outsider at thefringe.fm. Also donate to the station, too, if you like the station and you want more. Tonight our guest is Sean Cannon. Sean John Cannon. And look, when you go to the front page of the website, I got to tell you just real quick, I don't want to, you know, waste too much time here. We got like, this is our last segment, but your artwork is amazing, man. I'm just saying it's fantastic. Thank you so much. You know, when I went to Flagstaff, when I went to NAU, I, um, I wanted to be an astronomer because of Carl Sagan and, uh, you know, uh, I got a name in college algebra and I thought I deserved the Nobel peace prize and, um, I got into astronomy and I got a two W's, and my teacher said, you know, Sean, I really like you, but I don't think this is your field. And so my GPA was sustained. I think I had like a 372, and so I majored in English, got graduated with English, and got bored with English, and I started doodling on a napkin at Macy's Cafe in Flagstaff. And I thought, oh, my God, I want to be an artist. And so I came down to the University of Arizona and figured it out. <laughs> so that means a lot. Um, you saying that because hopefully it uh, resonates with people yeah it's fantastic and earlier in the show you brought up jordan maxwell who i've I've interviewed a few times and i gotta tell you he talks about with me we talked about a lot of the western esoteric stuff but we also talked about his alien stories and things but he would always end with uh what would he say he would say um you something about you think you know but you just you don't know there's so much that's what he wanted people to understand is all this stuff we think we know we don't know and there are certain things that you could tell like he really wanted to talk about now you know i've seen him on gaia i see him talking to certain people like you've talked to him too i think he's kind of opening up about all this stuff i mean what's going on with jordan man is he like getting into what you're talking about now as far as the vedic uh teachings go the relevance of my connecting with jordan there is no such thing as coincidences I used to think coincidences was a real phenomenon, but it isn't. And this, the relevance of this is, as I was trying to explain with Saturn, um, when Krishna left uh, 5,000 years ago in his Bhagavan form, 
the Kali Yuga, the 432,000 age of the Kali Yuga. It's the winter season of consciousness. It's the, it's the, the time cycle of low consciousness. Um, materialism is God, and the impersonalistic aspect of God is most prominent. And the Kali Yuga is the most munificent period, even though it's the most monstrous, because Krishna revealed himself very confidentially. And here's where I'm going with this. So when this time yuga was inaugurated 5,000 years ago, what, are, what have the ancients been telling us about our current time period? They, they prophesized a golden age, a 10,000-year golden age. It just so happens 500 years ago, a, a golden avatar of Krishna appeared called Lord Chaitanya, um, C-A-I-T-A-N-Y-A. He's the most confidential avatar, and he inaugurated the 10,000-year golden age within the Kali Yuga. And um, when the Renaissance movement began in Europe in the 15th century, you know, when he appeared on the other side of the, of the globe, it, you know, scholars declared that it's not coincidental that the Enlightenment Enlightenment period began with the appearance of Lord Chaitanya. And it's also understood that Lord Chaitanya's appearance is very rare within the universe. Um, he appears, according to the Vedas, once during the daytime in one of the thousand Maha Yugas, which is the same time as a thousand Maha Yugas, which equates to four billion. 320 million earth years, according to the Brahma Samhita Veda, which in actuality extends to 8 billion 640 million human years. So this avatar of Krishna is so rare. And a lot of spiritual people are sensing this shift, this multidimensional shift. And they're absolutely right. They're not crazy. We are all in this vibrational shift it's a solar event and like i was trying to say earlier vivasvan is the residing deity of our son his name is vivasvan beautiful being you can google image him from what the vedas you know the, he's been painted and what jordan is wanting to know now is in what is the relationship to the vedas the pole star and this golden avatar that even the most demoniac of beings don't understand, and they can't, they can't stop what is coming. You know, if you're a demon, if your consciousness is to lord it over the material nature and to manipulate and control and blah, 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 the para-atman, the super soul within that being, will turn off enlightened consciousness because that's not what the demon wants. He wants to, you know, he wants to lord it over. So it's like God's in your heart going, do you want FM or AM? <laughs> right, yeah, so demons, makes uh, sense. Demons don't have transcendental knowledge. So this transfiguration of the solar event that is coming, um, Lord Chaitanya inaugurated it, and essentially Krishna came in this most confidential avatar to experience what it's like for him to be a devotee. In other words, what is it like to find bhakti yoga? Bhakti means heart. Yoga means knowing the process of returning to your heart. And so he appeared 500 years ago, and uh, Lord Chaitanya um, made it possible for every living entity to go back to Krishna without any, any, uh, any resistance. And this is why, so if Saturn keeps us locked in the third dimension, right, Lord Chaitanya appeared to make it easier, to, to kind of like ease the tension, you know, because Saturn has a very intense nature. I mean, look how big his abode is. That planet's massive. Yeah. And he has a major influence on our planet. And so we are now in the golden age. We are 500 years, and we have 9,500 years of our sun that's, that's entered this highly charged, I think it's 3,000 degrees Celsius, this huge um, nebulous cloud that, and did you know that a lot of stars around us are going through their transfigurations right now? They're, they're going through their ships. And I saw some weird there. stuff in the sky tonight, actually. Uh, some twinkling stars that I've never seen before that were just turning all kinds of colors. But I'm not an astronomer, but I know I, I haven't seen them before. 
uh, like that. We, it, it's, it is an incredible time to be us. And, you know, and, that, and by the way, this mantra, this maha mantra, maha means great and mantra means get out of your mind. Lord Chaitanya uh, moved all over India chanting this Hare Krishna mantra. And that's why we see in every corner of the globe these really precious souls um, chanting Hare Krishna in the street. They're, they're gifting this sound vibration out to people. And it, it affects not only humans, it affects animals. It, it affects anything that has a soul because the, the vibration of it is non-biased. It's not prejudiced. It affects the soul. And that's the origin of the Hare Krishna movement is from Lord Chaitanya, this most confidential avatar. And in this golden age, angels, humans, and demons are given an opportunity to become enlightened. Wow. That is so powerful because demons only cause suffering because they're in suffering. Angels just want to do service because that's their nature. But angels aren't liberated beings. They have to come as a human to be liberated from the multiverse. So angels, humans, and demons in the Kali Yuga, they're, they're being given an opportunity to give service to Krishna. And that's oh. why this age that we're in is so munificent. Oh, and, that's um, fantastic. Yeah. Man, I got a question it, it, from uh, the Fringe FM chat from Gigi, uh, host of uh, Shift Happens. Says, Does the guest think that there might be some sort of intelligent life on Saturn with all of the deep spiritual historical relations with Saturn found in cultures throughout the world going back as long as history? It would just seem like there must be something there other than just a bunch of gas. Well, in our third dimension, that's a great... And you see, you notice how paradoxes keep coming up. Yeah. With our limited senses, imperfect limited senses, sorry, folks, your brain is not perfect. Your soul is. Your soul is your soul's eternal, full of bliss and omnipotent, just like God. But the brain, it's a third-dimensional computer. So our operandi, our apparatus sees it like that, but whatever dimension Saturn is in, I think it's in the fourth dimension, it looks totally different. In the third dimension, the sun looks like an elemental fire. In its dimension, it's a solar disk. That's such so a trip, man, because I was talking about Samael earlier, and he said that too. He said, we don't believe that there's life on all the planets that we, you know, based on our scientific studies here in the 3D realm, but they're the life on these planets live in different ways. Some are internal, some have different forms, even forms that we can't see, but there is definitely conscious life on all of these different planets, as he explained it. Like Morpheus was trying to red pill Neo. Like Krishna was trying to red pill Neo. Uh, sorry, Arjuna. The number one problem with the multiverse, Krishna says, Living entities, he doesn't say demigods or humans, he says living entities, lusting after the objects of the senses, thinking that to be real. So, and also, you know, so in actuality, we refine our senses by submitting, making the brain subordinate to the heart. And this is beyond, so this isn't esoteric, this is your birthright, this is your, your self action and liberational program, yoga. So it isn't supposed to be esoteric, but a lot of demons have ruled this world, and mm. they want to exploit, they want power, they want to become gods themselves. And so there's always a motivation, there's always a selfish motivation in the material energy. The spiritual world, apparently, is a cheesecake competition where everyone is trying to serve it to everyone else. In the material energy, it's completely different. Everyone wants it, but no one wants to make it. I know that's a goofy uh, analogy, but the eternal consciousness with God is service to every living entity, because that's your self-realized consciousness, service to God personally. Whereas in the material universe, we invert that. We are trying to exploit living entities here, and we are trying to survive death, not knowing that we will never die, and that we are never really born. Consciousness just flows into one form after another. And um, 
we can choose to have many more incarnations like this, or we can figure out a way out of this matrix. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, complexity I didn't go into, like Maya Dave. Maya is the goddess of illusion, and it's her job to bewilder living entities. It's, it's, it's like God, it's like Krishna playing chess. <laughs> he empowers her with the ability to bewilder us. And, you know, Krishna is not God in the spiritual world. There's no need There's no need for a Krishna to be God in the spiritual world. There is no governance in the spiritual world because it's unending love. It's selflessness. That's one of the attributions of eternality. The material universe, he has to dream it into fruition. He has to be the, the governor, and he upholds the mode of goodness. That's why... If any human behaves in the mode of goodness, the para-atman within the heart responds. And that's why Yeshua came here to learn that and to preach it. You know, uh, Yeshua was a bhakti yogi. <laughs> you know, he moved about. You know, that's why there's 30 years missing from his life in the Bible. You know, um, he, he lived in India. He was instructed bhakti yoga. That's why in the Catholic tradition, he's showing you his heart. The kingdom of God resides there as the super soul. You know, and so as people feel so discombobulated, as people right now feel so confused, they don't know what to do, I say this, why not investigate this science of how powerful mantras are, particularly the Krishna mantra, the Hare Krishna mantra. Investigate how sound affects your soul and make it a, make your life a collaboration with the with the um with the super soul within your heart that's probably the most important thing i could ever tell anyone in my 12 years of journeying with bhakti yoga i always feel like a kid because there's so much more to experience because god's unlimited but if we only think we are our senses and our body we're going to be conditioned by the material modes of nature of goodness passion and ignorance and we're also going to be enacting out our karma, and with that karma, our so-called desires, and that's why we suffer so much here. You know, it, it would appear that God is so um, unfair at times, but in actuality, God's playing fair with our allotments, with our karma, and everything else that we have. But what, what God would like to do is take that ocean of activity and shrink it down to the size of a cow's footprint. So that we can cross over when we have to give up this body at some point which is inevitable you don't die your consciousness transfers on we can decide right in this life where we go we got a caller from uh, looks like nine seven eight area code you're on the air who are we speaking with hey joe hey sean it's uh, the night stalker the what's night stalker on? i gotta get you a jingle brother what's going on <laughs> hey really cool show so far uh sean you're really bringing the heat tonight a lot of uh, cool information, a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, there's a million things I wish I could have commented on, but I'm working and it was busy. But you, you were mentioning earlier all like the uh, like how extreme like the the concept of eternity is, and uh, you drew like a bunch of cool metaphors. And there's one that I heard that I that I really like that I thought was cool. Um, is that we've re- we've reincarnated as many times as it would take um, to erode a mountain with uh, a bird dropping a feather onto it every once every uh, 100,000 years or something like that. Like, that's how many times or how long it would take to, like, uh, or, or how long we've been reincarnating for. Uh, that was, like, a pretty crazy thing. Like, for a, a bird to drop a feather on the top of a mountain every 1,000 years, how long it would take to, to erode that mountain down to, to, to nothing. That's a lot. So, I thought that was cool. You just... You just blow my mind. <laughs> I, uh, I, and you know, it's really beautiful. I think I it was, um, reflect a... I, I got, sorry. I, I, I'm pretty sure it was uh, Neem Karoli Baba who said that, I think, if you want to look it up or whatever. But uh, I got I to gotta get going. A really Thanks, great show. Brother. Awesome stuff, you guys. The Night Stalker strikes again. Good call there. Thank you. What was you saying there, Sean? If I could reflect upon something that we talked about at the beginning, some beautiful souls conceive the universe created itself to understand itself. Notice the impersonal nature there. What if the super soul also created the multiverse to enjoy the process of the soul ultimately returning home? 
And I think that's the greatest love story we don't know about. And we can uncover that. I can, I'm with you. I mean, we're coming back full circle to what we talked about at the beginning of the broadcast is I, I think, uh, everybody's, we, we get so caught up in, uh, the destination. We forget about the ride and the ride is the best part. Like you want to, want to, a lot of these beings, you know, there was a book called a conversation with God. I'm sure everybody talked about it or read it. It was Neil Donald Walsh where the guy claimed he talked to God. So he realized that he could talk to God, not just people that were in the Bible or whatever. Like there's no special people that can talk to God. Everybody can. And, um, he, the God was telling him, he was like, you, he's like, why do we keep coming back? And he said, well, cause you love it all. He said, I love the suffering. He goes, yeah, you love the pain, the love, the hurt, the joy, the food, the scenery, the smells, you love it all, you know? And, and it, it's I noticed how those things crazy, are, right? are truly, I notice how those things are optional. We don't have to suffer, but ignorance is the major B-I-T-C-H in the room. Ignorance is our, is our choosing. We can get rid of our ignorance. And I just want to let people know that I would like to send people my multi-dimensional tour of the multiverse from a Vedic perspective and people can connect with me at um, seanvedicvisuals at gmail.com or seanjohncannon.com and I will send it all to you. It's, 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 there's many emails but they're chronological and it's a visual tour of the multiverse. I'd love to share that with anyone who would want them. Yeah, definitely. I'll probably hit you up on that too, man. Cause that sounds really cool. Well, listen, like uh, we're running out of time here, but I really appreciate you coming on the show. I have to have you back again so we can tell more of your stories. Cause I know you've got quite a few experiences with stuff too. And I love to hear about those. Uh, a lot of people listen to the show. They're either into one or two things. Usually it's like hidden, you know, occult type esoteric stuff or, uh, aliens. But, and there's a mass mass quantity of people that listen to this show that's also into consciousness exploration and i tend to like all three of those subjects so yeah we'll have maybe, to have you maybe back next time, maybe next time i can tell you about my bigfoot stories and i have to say you're one of the most gracious hosts i can't believe how fast two hours has gone and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share i'm a vedic broadcaster i'm not a teacher i'm not i'm not a guru i want to broadcast um, the, the beautiful things I've come to know. And thank you for making that happen tonight. Oh, yeah, man, that's not a problem. Not a problem at all. And, uh, yeah, a time sure does fly by when you're having fun, doesn't it? <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> you guys really go check out the website, seanjohncannon.com. I really want you to at least look at the artwork and then check out the – I'll leave the email, too, so you can get that virtual tour as well. And uh, don't please don't forget to if you want you really need to you got to sign up to the Patreon because we got some cool stuff coming in there. Once we get the station wrapped up and all of our stuff going, I'll really be able to focus on it. I've got the new tarot video up. Uh, the we'll have new episodes of the Astral Journal in there. And for all of you, the new guys that signed up, thank you so much for signing up to the Patreon. I really appreciate it. Uh, tomorrow night on the program, we're gonna have Nick Hinton on from saturntimecube.com how synchronistic right twitter.com forward slash nick hinton that's kind of a synchro right there isn't it that we've been talking about saturn and he's going to be coming on so and then we're also going to have uh, eric rains we're also going to have mr frank jacob and then friday night is our new moon special with mary Ducina. you guys we got to get out of here I want to thank pacho for making this all happen my producer patrick newland you guys in the fringe fm chat a warm shout out to the patrons and all of my love to the Fringe FM staff and their team. And the music behind all of this, the Steezy Stevie is the DJ. The music production is by Kronoks, my man, from Belgium. We'll be back tomorrow night, same time. Stay tuned for the secret teachings right here on the Fringe FM right after this. Good night.
reflect those of the Fringe FM, KTLK Digital Broadcasting, its sponsors, affiliates, or staff. Listener discretion is advised. Live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about his religion. Respect others and their views and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and of service to your people. When your time comes to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with fear of death so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home.